Dr. Ingo Mearsbach. Ingo will get started in just a few minutes, but first, a few quick housekeeping items for those of you in attendance today. Uh, firstly, today's webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the on-demand version via email in a couple of business days. Uh, you're free to share the link with colleagues who weren't able to attend today's live session. Second, if you're having trouble with audio or video, your best bet is to try logging out and logging back in, which usually resolves the issue. And lastly, we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So as we go through the material, if you've got questions, uh, take notes, write them down, and we will answer them at the end. So we'll leave some time, and uh, I think you'll find Ingo will have lots of uh, great answers for you. So with that, Ingo, I'd love to hand it over to you, and let's get started. Hey, perfect. Thanks, Tom. And, uh, Tom, and welcome, everybody, to today's webinar on deep learning. Of course, it's a super important topic right now. So um, we will really cover all three big and important questions on deep learning. The first question is, what is deep learning actually in the first place? Uh, what can deep learning do for you? Uh, where can you apply it? What kind of use cases are, are really great for deep learning or the other way around? Where is deep learning really great for what kind of use cases? And then last but not least, and maybe maybe most important, how can you really use deep learning? So um, the, the focus on the how, so I will show this to you um, in, in a quick demonstration as well. So first of all, what is it's actually deep learning. So the, probably the, the, the moment where most people got exposed to deep learning was a couple of months ago where it was all over the news that um, an artificial intelligence based on deep learning wins against the world champion in Go. That was very exciting. Uh, no question about that. Um, because many people thought this game is way too complex so it will take years until we finally will build a machine able to beat the world champion in this game. Um, some people even claimed it's never possible. I think that's really, in general, a great idea to bet against an artificial intelligence in general in a task where it's mainly about making rational decisions. And I would be more than happy to have a great discussion with you guys on uh, the pros and cons of the AI and all the ethical implications. Probably not today, but if you like, write me on Twitter, and, and I'm sure that I will make sure that I will ask it to you. But for now, the important thing really is it, it, we made a tremendous progress thanks to deep learning also in the broader AI space. Sometimes I'm a little bit sad, so we have this great success and all people and think, oh my God, now robot armies are taking over the world um, and, and will kill us all. So I, I don't think that's the point in general. Um, I really think deep learning can help us, machine learning can help us, AI can help us in a lot of different and exciting areas. Um, and you should really know what, what, what those areas are and, and how to use those technologies in, a, in the best possible way. So bring us to the first important question. So what exactly is deep learning? Is this the same as AI? I'm sometimes surprised that actually many people ask me, hey, Ingo, are you also doing AI? Like, uh, well, what exactly do you mean? Well, yeah, I heard about this deep learning stuff. Like, okay, that's really not exactly the same thing. So just as a primer here, those are the three topics. AI, machine learning, and deep learning. And the AI is really the big bucket. Um, so many of you probably know, but just as a reminder for all of us, AI is this big bucket containing all the techniques which enable computers in general to mimic human behavior. And there's a lot of different research trends going into AI. There's natural language understanding. There's computer vision. There's, of course, machine learning, the most important of all the research areas within the artificial intelligence bucket. So machine learning now is a subset of those techniques and those, or the subset really focuses on enabling machines to improve with experience. And most of the times that means experience is, well, captured in form of data. So we look into data describing the past and learn from this data that our own behavior or the behavior of machines um, to get better over time, so that's the learning aspect of it. And that often allows us also for a new situation, if you have data describing the current situation we are in right now, to also learn from the past and predict what's going to happen. That's how predictive analytics and machine learning are connected. And then as part of machine learning, there's uh, then a subset of methods again, of machine learning methods, which basically really make the computation of multi-layer neural networks feasible. And as a result of this, the exciting thing about those multiple layers, and we will see this a little bit later, is that we will get something for free. We typically would, would need to put some or some good amount of work into to, to be equally good with other machine learning methods. So those are the three topics. Today we will focus on deep learning. Um, and so let's stay, start on the basics. Um, and I will try and do my best to explain to you what exactly it is. 
I can't avoid to use a formula or two, so I'm sorry for that in case of people who don't want to see this, but I also use some cute images of dogs and cats to make up for that. So let's uh, start on the images first, and then we have a formula or two, but um, I think both are important to understand the concept. So we start with a binary classification problem. Uh, you probably are familiar with this if you're familiar with machine learning and data science in general, but the idea here really is you have data points in a multidimensional space, and you want to classify those data points into two or more different classes. So in our example here on the right, we have four images of animals. Uh, we see one red data point, point um, on, the, on the top right corner and a blue data point on the bottom left, or more on the, towards the bottom of this uh, first graph. And what is this graph? Really, we have two dimensions, the size of the animal and the domestication. Uh, I can now take different animals. I, I encounter and put them somewhere on this graph. And while I'm doing this, I will try to find a separating line between those two classes. In this case, it's a very simple approach, a linear line. And as you can see in the first picture, that probably wouldn't be the line I would pick if I only have those two data points. But it's the correct answer. So there's an infinite amount of or infinite number of correct solutions. This is one of them. And typically, most machine learning methods, while you're adding more and more data points to, into the mix, will adapt to the position of the separating hyperplane, as we call this line, um, and, and try to figure out, OK, well, can I describe this plane or this, uh, this hyperplane in a good way so it separates the two classes of animals or just the colors red and blue here for us? So that's what most learning methods or many learning methods, linear learning methods are doing. And what you often end up with is a formula like the following one. So the function which describes which class an animal belongs to, cat or dog in this example, um, can be calculated. So for example here, this animal is a dog if two times the size of the animal plus three times the domestication minus some arbitrary value like, not arbitrary, but some value like uh, minus 250 is greater than zero. Well, then it's a dog, and otherwise it's a cat. Of course, now the goal is to actually find those numbers, 2, 3, and 250. The 2 and 3 are important because they tell us which is the more important um, well, dimension here in our space. So right now, since 3 is higher than 2, we could assume that domestication might be more important, but of course, that also depends on the scale of the dimension. So size, we might measure in inches, or we might measure it in meters, or in centimeters, or whatever it is. Domestication might be on a scale between 1 and 10. Who knows? But of course, those exact numbers depend also on the scales, but they often give us some good insight into what is more important. And in this case, it might, case, it might be domestication. So it's like feature weights explain this to us. So that's very well known. I assume that most people here in the audience today know, of course, the approach. Um, it's a linear classifier. This is exactly the outcome of a linear regression model or a linear support vector machine and many, many others. OK, so that's the basic problem. So back to deep learning then. Can we maybe, can we maybe learn from our own bodies, and that was exactly what people did in the past, can we actually try to mimic the behavior of the human brain? So let's look into our own brain, and somebody did it, did it apparently, and found out, well, there's a lot of those neurons in this part of the brain uh, structure, and each neuron consists of multiple parts. And on the left here, we see those dendrites. And those dendrites, they actually listen to imp electrical impulses coming from neighbor neurons. So they basically are connected to other neurons. And they then react and basically sum up all the electrical signals um, those dendrites are collecting. And then if this is high enough, they send a signal themselves, or the neurons send the signal through this axon into those synaptic terminals connecting to other neurons. OK, so what has this to do with our, with our function? Well, remember this picture here. Because we can actually try to mimic the behavior of the brain cells to derive very similar functions to the one we just saw before. So here on the left, where the dendrites have been before, we have the inputs of our space, x1 to xn. x1, for example, could be the size of our animals. x2 is the domestication level. And then there's this x01, which is just a constant, typically 1. Um, and by assigning a certain weight, like W0 here of 250, you would end up with the 250 we saw in the, in the formula before. So if you just sum up the weighted input factors here, that's what happens in the left blue bubble, and deliver this to this activation function here in the right blue bubble, which basically introduces this if function, well, then that's exactly what we have seen before. So all the inputs, the electrical signals from the neuron, 
are somehow weighted and summed up, and then they either fire a new signal in, into the output or not, a one or a zero. Well, it's kind of the same thing. So this structure derived from the neuron in the, neuron in the, in the human brain, or at least uh, somewhat resembles the structure, this actually leads to the same formula we have seen before in the linear regression. So that's exciting. So we can actually say that maybe our brain is doing something similar here. But is this good enough? Well, it turns out this perceptron alone, that's how this thing is called, is really not that powerful as a machine learning method. But what if we combine multiple of those perceptrons next to each other? This is this blue layer in the middle here. So, and if we do this, we really get a true network, like the brain, of multiple cells. All right, let's do that. So we introduce this concept of a hidden layer here. So left still, we have the inputs, right, we have an output. If you have this hidden layer, of multiple perceptrons taking the weighted inputs and have some activation function. But in this case, the activation function is no longer just this linear step function we have seen before, but it can be also a nonlinear function originally called a so-called sigmoid function, which resembles like an S-curve, which was a little bit smoother. It's important, well, for the third element, which is, well, how do we actually now figure out what the right words are? Before it was complex enough already, just in this linear regression-like case or for the perceptron, we only had like one weight per input, but now everything is connected to everything else. So we have a lot of connections, and each connection gets its own weight, and we need to figure out what the right weights are. And that's exactly what this backpropagation algorithm is doing. So the basic idea is it compares what, in a forward way, this net would calculate based on the inputs, from, and it compares this result to what the result should actually be. And if there's an error, it propagates this error back. And in order to be able to do that, those activation functions need to be differentiable. I'm not going into the mathematical uh, details here, but that's exactly the reason why we no longer have this step function, but the sigmoid S-shaped curve. Anyway, so those are the three elements which turn a perceptron into multiple perceptrons and then into a network. And this is the way how we train this. All right. Well, if you're there already, why not just saying, well, we can have multiple levels. So instead of just having one level of, of perceptron here, we can have another um, hidden layer of um, even more perceptron. The numbers can differ and, and everything, but this is just the basic ideas. We, 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 yeah, we, we add another level or maybe two levels. And that leads to something scientifically would call this multi-layer feed-forward artificial neural network, which are trained with a stochastic gradient descent using back propagation. And I, I have to admit, that's, that's not a hip name. Um, that, that doesn't really fly well from a marketing perspective. And that's probably what many other people also thought. And that's why they came up with a new name for this thing. And they called it deep learning. So here you have it. This really is what deep learning is. It is this basic idea of this perception resembling a linear regression function adding multiple of them into hidden layers, having multiple hidden layers, so you end up with a multi-layer feed-forward network. And you train those, all those connections and weights. And that's exactly what a deep learning network actually is. Well, of course, things didn't stop there. And there are certain flavors or variants of deep learning which have been developed from that basic idea. So for example, on the left, we have something we call convolutional neural networks. And here, the idea is that each input, those orange bubbles on the left, each input basically is not just like one data point or one value, but it's actually kind of like a rectangular field over a 2D input matrix. So we have not uh, just like whatever like set of values, but we really have like two-dimensional inputs, like for example an image, and then you move those rectangular small fields over this image, and you can, for example, apply some calculations like building an average of what you see there, and feed that now into the input of the neural network. And if you do this, well, then you can actually learn what's going on in those images. And that's exactly the reason why those convolutional neural networks have been very, very successful in computer vision, for example, for recognizing handwriting, recognizing what kind of objects are inside of an image. Um, if you think about, like, uh, let's say the US Postal Service, if they read, um, like, handwritten zip codes on, on letters, well, nobody's actually reading this. Um, so those are machines which are automatically reading those, um, those zip codes, for example to route where the letters are going. So just as one of the use cases, so it's important to be really correct in those situations because of, otherwise the letters would just go everywhere. So um, another example would be so-called recurrent neural networks. Here, you take the same structure, but now you can also build uh, directed circuits with those connections. And that actually is doing something which is um, giving those neural networks now 
kind of a state. Um, so they get like like a short-term memory, really. Interesting, um, because now you, while you're training and while you're going over input data, you actually can remember what happens the data set the data set before or the data point before. And if you improve there, for another variant are so-called long short-term memories. Um, you actually can remember yeah quite a lot. And if you do this. Well, that's, that's the kind of algorithm which is really successful, for example, on speech recognition, where you know, well, just a second before, I had a sound which sounds like an A, maybe, and then there's the next sound is whatever, uh, L, so together it's L. So, so this is the kind of application where you need some memory because you need to know what happened before to also say what's most likely the outcome for, for, for the current situation. And that's why it's so successful in speech recognition. If you use your iPhone and ask something to Siri, LSTM is the technology which is used. If you lose, uh, use Alexa, same story. Any kind of good speech recognition as of today are using this kind of technologies. All right. So those are variants of the of the basic idea of this multi-layer neural network or deep learning approach. Um, but those variants are really very well on those use cases. So are there others? Uh, so we now move to the next section here um, about how where can we where can we use deep learning? Where is it really in particular strong? Well. To answer that question, where is deep learning really strong, you can also well, reformulate this question to like, well, what is the advantage of having multiple hidden layers in the first place? And you can have a look at the picture on the right side here. Um, I think it explains it very well. The idea if you have multiple layers at the top here, you basically get all kinds of images in, in this image recognition or, uh, use case here. It also the kind of images there, and each image is the raw pixel data. Like, okay, here's a pixel that's red, and here's another pixel which is green. It's very raw, it's kind of noisy. But in the first layer here, we can now start actually to, well, generate information based on the information we get delivered from the previous layer. So the first layer, we get the raw data, but the neurons we are creating here, they might react or activate their electrical signal to the next layer based on finding some specific small structures. So for example, they could react to small circles or lines or rectangular shapes or whatever it is. So some basic structures, and then those basic structures, if they fire, they can now be used in the next layer to create features or higher level features. So for example, multiple of those structures might form a nose, and other structures might form a paw. And the paw of a cat looks a little bit different than the paw of a, of a, of a, of a Um, you can have a, a neuron for each kind of animal using the kind of higher level features we have seen before. So, and this is exactly what those hidden layers, those multiple hidden layers are doing for you. And this is exactly where, where deep learning is really strong in cases where you would need to extract those describing features. And that's nothing new. So feature, extraction of features, generating of new features, feature selection, that's all part of a topic which is called feature engineering. I happen to write good chunks of my PhD actually exactly on this part, uh, on, on this topic. Feature engineering is extremely important. It all, most often makes the difference between a mediocre classifier and a really good one. It's not so much the learning method you use, it's how you transform the input space for this learning method. So that's often so much more important, really. Well, and that explains why deep learning is, is, uh, is set up right now also, because it is doing this automatically for you. So instead of you sitting down and describing all those features and how to extract them, well, deep learning is doing this in an implicit manner automatically for you. That's great. That really can save you a lot of time. And in the situation and use cases where you need to do feature engineering, well, this is certainly should be a part of your toolbox then and try out deep learning because you can set easily a good benchmark, which you still might be improved with additional feature engineering, but you get a very good result pretty quickly right away. So that sounds awesome. But if it's the case, so what's the catch? Um, if it's so great, well, are there, are there disadvantages? And unfortunately, the best thing about deep learning is this implicit engineering, and the biggest disadvantage of deep learning is this implicit feature engineering. And so often, what makes it so good, unfortunately, also well, creates the drawbacks. So the first thing, really, which is a little, little bit annoying, you can't really see those hidden features. You can't really learn anything from this. You don't really know it's important to learn the concept of a nose to distinguish between 
uh, cats and dogs, for example. Well, it's not exactly true. There are techniques to get to this point, but it's not, ex it's not easy. And most people just can't. And it's often so complex and it's so hidden. And there's so many things playing together that it's very hard to make a clear statement and to learn something to, for example, change your course of action in a business use case. Uh, so those, those hidden features can be powerful, but there's not much that they're hidden to learn from. And that also is in general true. It's really hard to understand a neural network, and the same is true for a deep learning network. It's extremely difficult to understand. Um, you will understand a, a linear regression function, for sure. You see what are the important features and how they contribute to the, to the prediction. You understand the decision tree, for sure. Um, there's not people who claim to, that they are able to understand a support vector model. Neural networks, not so much. There's really not much you can do. You can use this inside of some simulation, but you can't just look at the model and understand what's going on. So you can't understand what are the hidden processes you want to detect. So yeah, the black box, and that's, um, that's also sometimes difficult because people can't build trust in this model. Well, you saw all those connections. Um, and you learn, need to learn all those weights. And if you need to do this and then iterate all the data over and over and over again, well, that explains why, unfortunately, deep learning is kind of slow. It's really not one of the fastest algorithms. Uh, it's very complex. The more hidden layers you have, the more nodes you have, the, the longer the run times. Uh, it's really not one of the fastest. It's not like a simple perceptron, a linear regression, or like a naive base. Um, it's way, way, way slower. And unfortunately, still until today, it's also one of the techniques which are more prone to overfitting. There is some kind of, we call it regularization also for neural networks. It's just not as good in many cases, or, well, it's easy to work around it, let's put it that way, by setting up different network architectures or setting up different parameters, and, and then it still runs into overfitting quite easily. What does overfitting mean? Well, you just memorize the data. You're not really learning something. You're not generalizing from the data. And that means like, if you see a situation which is kind of similar to what you saw before, but well, just a little bit different, the, the, the prediction can be all over the place. And it's unfortunately, well, you don't really feel it learned something. So um, that's not really great, because you, of course, want to have a model which generalizes very well, which is a more robust model, uh, which is also going to work on slight changes of the data in the future and create good predictions for that case. Um, and you can get there with the deep learning network. It's just much more difficult to get there. And most people still end up with a somewhat overfitted model. So everything here together now explains that deep learning really is in particular successful with in cases where you need feature engineering, so like in image or speech recognition, that's, um, that's just a must in those cases anyway, um, or also in other use cases where you have raw sensor data. Um, but in other situations, it might actually be better to use your more scalable, more robust, less overfitting me methods um, together maybe with a little bit of feature engineering, uh, and you might end up with much better model overall. So don't think it's always the best solution in all cases. OK, so what are those use cases? Um, so we talked about image recognition and speech recognition, but that's not a use case every single company might have. So here's a small selection of different use cases which either drive revenue, reduce costs, or avoid risks. And well, in all of those categories, you will find use cases where if you think about this, feature engineering can be very helpful. So for example, in the top box here, you might have some um, applications in uh, web analytics or for sure in pricing optimization. Um, they really look into like, time series data about the past where you can or would usually extract some features anyway. Um, and here, learning might be a very, really good um, good, good technology. There's a certain situation also in cross and upselling, customer acquisition, or customer analytics in general, where you have a lot of customer transactions, again, where you would typically do some feature extraction, where deep learning can be very successful as well. Environments are often there. Sensor gum coming into the system. Again, deep learning can be very strong because it is doing this implicit feature engineering for you. So those are just some examples. But in general, like of course, we use it for your use case and see how well it works. You brings me to the last segment of uh, today's webinar: is um, how can you now use deep learning? I'm like, okay, with all those like network structures, etc. Isn't that very complex and 
Good news is, uh, no, not at all. I'm going to show this to you like in, in a minute here, in a couple of uh, minutes uh, of a demonstration. So um, let's move over to Rapid Miner in a small demonstration. I hope you can see it in your screen. I know you guys can't answer, but I'm, um, I'm just thinking it works. So let's see. Um, so let's quickly build the first process, but then in the interest of time, I will learn loads from others. I'm not explaining whole Rapid Miner to you now here, but the basic idea is, in case you don't know it yet, Build those analytical workflows um, here in the center of the screen, like base comp composed of data sets and uh, basic building blocks we call operators here. So let's build a very simple one on one of my favorite data sets, the Sonar data set. So you just drag in the data and you build a workflow by connecting those operator blocks. This one here just retrieves the data set. And well, you're connecting them by, by well, clicking and, and dragging. Okay, so this is the data set, just quickly. Uh, lots of uh, numbers here in this data, uh, lots of different columns here. This is actually sensor data coming from a star, so this is describing a frequency band. Uh, not a particular large data set, it's only a couple of hundred uh, rows or examples here. But um, the goal is to distinguish uh, between the sonar symbols of rocks versus mines. For the own here, I have some mines. Well, it's roughly like 50% rocks, 50% are mines. Okay. So um, it's frequency bands. I, I told you before, if I look into the data here in the scatter plot, you can see already, okay, using the first two bands here, there is not really any pattern I see. Maybe more here towards the upper right, there's more, more mines than rocks, but I don't know. If I look into a petal plot here showing basically now every line is one row in my data set, I need to distinguish between the, the red and the blue ones. Um, yeah, it's not really a clear pattern. I can easily see at least. So, well, it's it's a tough question, but it's frequency band. It's kind of sensor data. So deep learning, again, might be very helpful. So let's use it. And how do you use it? Well, you type in deep learning here. There's an operator. You drag it in. And that's kind of it. So here, here you have now your deep learning uh, uh, operator inside of this data flow. And, well, that's all you need to do. So we can't change the parameters here. Um, and the most important are those here, like this defining the hidden layers and everything else. But hey, let's just go with the basics, and I can run this post now. And, and well, it's done now. I get a very, very good um, a training error, although don't pay too much attention to the training errors. Again, if you only pay attention to the training error, you would definitely will run into overfitting. So um, make sure that you also validate this process here properly. So this is what I'm showing you next. Um, uh, next thing would actually be to validate this uh, this, uh, this, this learner. I am not building all those processes, but quickly ex quick explanation. So I have a cross validation here. This, by the way, is now parallelized completely in the, with the new version 7.3 we just released a couple of days ago. So give it a try. Um, a lot of uh, we, we introduced a complete new parallelization framework, so things are much smarter, faster now. So anyway, um, so we take the deep learning, train basically 10 different models, always on 90% of the data, and apply this model on the remaining 10%, and build the approach of all those 10 runs. And if I do this now here, um, well, it takes a couple of seconds. But now I'm getting actually quite good accuracy of like 79%. Um, and all the other values, are, and I'm not going all the details here. So well, it looks quite good for this data set. So I skip this one here. But maybe I show you this ROC comparison, where I take the same data set and actually now compare the R curves for uh, a deep learning model and gradient booster tree. So now what happens here is instantly I run like a tenfold cross validation, create the ROC curve, average those curves for both deep learning as well as gradient booster trees. And as you know, often gradient booster trees are among the best methods. And even here you see that there are certain situations where gradient booster trees are, are better. I can tell you already that would be the next one, but it takes too long, so I'm skipping this for today. If I optimize the time just for deep learning here in this process, I actually end up roughly about here, and I can't get much higher with gradient booster tree. So in, in this particular data set, uh, I could probably change uh, at least one thing here. Let's see if I can, I don't know. Uh, let's actually see. Um, I think we, it may, we might end up with a better result already, uh, uh, just with this one single change here. Let's uh, let's quickly check. Um, anyway, my point is, on this kind of data set, deep learning often outperforms. Um, sorry, no, it's pretty much the same. Okay, anyway, so outperforms um, other learning methods. So if I, on the other hand, want to tune those parameters, that's a process I, I talked about before. There are 
all kinds of operators in RapidMiner for doing that. So in this case, I actually say like, okay, I would like to tune the apps and the learn rate. You can also tune the network structure. Uh, I added some logging inside of this process here as well, so that actually while it's running, you can go here to those results into this log uh, window, and actually you see that for all the different combinations, they're added now while this process is running, for all the different combinations, what is the accuracy? So in this case, with 120 epochs and a learning rate of 0 0.003, we get an 81% accuracy, 82 almost here, 150, okay, that looks good. So I can sort it now and, and basically find out now what is the best result. Oh, look at that here, it's even better. Anyway, I'm stopping this process here. I just want to give you the idea. You can combine here in RapidMiner the whole um, anti ladder of different like validation methods, optimization, but also feature engineering uh, methods together with deep learning and it's just like dragging, dragging in the deep learning methods and that's all you need to do. Um, yeah, I'm skipping the next one as well in, in the interest of time here, but, but here's, for example, one example. Let me show you the different data sets where I use the Titanic training data. And here, for example, gradient booster trees clearly outperform um, deep learning. And so I think that's just an important takeaway here that there are certain situations where deep learning is just not as good as, as many people believe. Since we do uh, almost the end, um, the, uh, this is debunking some myths. That's what I always love to do, uh, see what people actually believe is going on and um, see what, the, what reality looks like. So the first myth is, well, deep learning seems to be this brand new class of algorithms and this, uh, like, yeah, something like which has only has been developed in, in, in recent years. And that's actually not true at all. Uh, I mentioned the Persetron before. It was actually developed in 1957 already. The first multi-layer neural network was published about in 1965. So this is a 50-year-old technology. Well, that's still younger than linear regression, which is roughly 200 years old, but still. Um, this is by no means like it has only been created in the last couple of years. It's just the reality. It has been around. Why, why is it now hip? It's all of a sudden, why are people caring now? And the reason really is that it was kind of overshadowed for multiple decades now by other learning methods, like, for example, support vector machines, which have been just more computationally feasible. In all recent year, years, we have more parallel compute power. We have uh, new things like GPUs. And now, actually, well, we can speed up the, um, the calculation. I think that those two things really go together and that's why deep learning was all of a sudden uh, getting the success. It probably should have been earlier, the earlier, but it was computationally not feasible. Okay. And the second myth is deep learning is a lot of hidden sets. It's not really true. It's really, you only need two. Otherwise, it's hard to justify the name deep learning. Uh, it will just be a regular uh, uh, neural network probably, but um, yeah, but it's not always a great idea to add like hundreds of layers at the same time. Well, sure, the learning method gets better, but also the risk for overfitting increases because the more complex the model can be, well, if you're not stopping it, it will get more complex and with increasing complexity, also the risk of overfitting increases. And the third one is really like, well, deep learning, that is really the strongest machine learning method we have right now. Well, it is definitely strong methods, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not. It is really among the strongest methods we have currently. Um, there are certainly a couple of others which are very strong as well, but not always the right tool in all cases. I repeat what I said before, it's often a great idea in cases where we would need to do some feature engineering anyway, but they are, they are drawbacks. They're difficult to tune, risk of fitting is high, it's very slow compared to others. Um, so, and from certain data sets, other machine learning methods can just be much stronger. So, I think it's important to understand, and that's still true to the day, uh, even some people say, well, the whole idea of a no free lunch theorem might not be applicable any longer. My point really is, in my experience, just in practical work, there is no silver bullet in machine learning. There just isn't. Yes, there are certain situations where deep learning is best. There are other situations where trees or random forests are best. best. And sometimes it's just like a linear regression or decision tree. It also depends on so many things. It's really not always the right thing to do. So I would like you to see deep learning as just another tool in your machine learning toolbox. It solves the same kind of problem other machine learning methods are solving. It's a very powerful tool, but sometimes it's not the right tool. It's not for some problems, even the most powerful tool is just not the right one. So 
have it in your tool belt for for your yeah um, for your machine learning work, but also try out others. Um, there's often situations where others are better. So I'd like to conclude now before we uh, do a bit of Q and A with a little bit of an, of an idea of what might happen next. Well, I don't really know. Um, well, although we are in the uh, predicting the future business, um, it's sometimes hard to tell. But I personally think this whole concept of adding some form of memory to learning methods in general, especially to neural networks, might actually be a very important one. Because that all of a sudden allows you to also learn much more complex structures. So instead of just learning a function, which, which basically says for a certain input, the certain value of the output, the output can be maybe a strong or maybe even as complex as a complete algorithm, which depends on the input values. So, and this kind of more complex structure requires actually some form of memory, otherwise you will never get there. And there's some early research which is going into this direction, and there are some promising results, and this will be the, indeed the next thing, whatever the name is going to be, which replaces um, deep learning. So this form of like a memory-based reasoning uh, powered by machine learning, we'll see exactly how the name will play out. Okay, so at this point, I would like to thank you already now for your um, uh, attending this webinar. Uh, we, we will have some Q uh, questions and answers, of course. Uh, you can go online uh, on rapidminer.com. You can download RapidMiner yourself and try it yourself. It's definitely fun to, to um, work with deep learning. It's often very powerful, as I said. So give it a try, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Ingo. As a reminder, we'll be sending a recorded version of today's presentation to the next few bit states via email. And we've got lots of really interesting questions that have come in. So uh, go get ready. Uh, first question is, all of the examples that you demonstrated today, those are all um, a part of RapidMiner Studio, right? Right. Uh, absolutely. So um, you, yeah, so, uh, it's, it's, you can just download it. You can, uh, it's, it's all in there. We can actually even make the, the process available. I think, um, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think we should maybe write a short blog post or something and, and, put the, uh, and put the process and the data there as, as well so people can, can use this as a starting point for their own experiments. Excellent. Will do. Okay. So the first two questions are around GPUs. So with new GPUs, cheaper computing power, et cetera, can we not think about DSVM or something in that direction? And the second question is something to announce around rapid minor support for GPU. Sure. Uh, let's start on the first one. Well, for sure, if you think about GPUs and in general parallel computing, there are some techniques where you where you can make use of parallel computing. Because that's really well, there's two things: parallel computing and GPUs, and there's also much faster uh, work with uh, matrix operation like like uh, factorization or multiplying different matrices and etc. SVM um, are really really difficult to parallelize. In fact, whenever you start really doing this, most of the case you're not ending up with SVM. Unfortunately, any longer. There are some approximations to support vector machines. Um, most frequently, actually based on um, simplified versions, only using linear kernel functions or uh, forms of iterative or stream enabled SVMs, which are easier to parallelize. But those are actually no longer real true SVMs. So I might need to check my research papers again, but in the last, uh, maybe there has been something in the last six to 12 months, but before I didn't see anything where I would say, like, yes, this is exactly a truly parallelized SVMs. But there are, you can parallelize um, and also run on GPUs, linear regression. Um, there's a lot of, of course, like k-means clustering, nice base is pretty trivial. Um, there's a lot of algorithms where it's much, much simpler. And I think we are still kind of in the infancy in, in terms of parallelizing our machine learning algorithms. There's still a lot of work in front of research and also companies like Rapid Miner um, to implement stable and robust versions of this. So that on the algorithms itself, for Rapid Miner and GPUs, we are actually right now um, actively looking into this. Um, some people might have been getting even an email from us uh, in the audience today. Um, so we. we yeah, looking into this, um, we are actually actively talking to NVIDIA as well, um, based on the AUQDA uh, graphic cards. It's not in the product yet, but stay tuned. Uh, it's definitely a topic we are really interested in, and there might be something down the road. Excellent. Thank you, Ingo. The next question is, uh, you had mentioned that deep learning is slow. Is it slow in learning or during deployment to produce predictions or both? 
it's it's one of the slowest actual terms of um, it's not as slow as the ten years neighbors, but it's one of the slower ones in terms of even the prediction of the score part. And the reason is because you still need to go through the whole network, apply all those uh, calculations for every single score. That's much more complicated than let's say what you need to do uh, in an SVM case or like let's think a linear regression. You really have just kind of an, it only depends on the number of inputs, but that's it. And there's not multiple steps you need to do on, on, on that. So it's relatively slow even in terms of prediction, but the real slow part is, is the model training. So it's, yes, it's slower than predicting with a regression model, but it's still very fast on the prediction side. Uh, the modeling part itself is where, where things are much, much slower than, than others. And it's hard to, to put the numbers, of course, because it depends on the data set and so many other uh, the, 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 the parameters, like if you have hidden layers with 100 nodes each, it's definitely slower than, uh, and, and then, let's say, a very small network architecture. So it's, it's hard to say. I can't give you numbers. But in overall, the experience often is like, ooh, yeah, it takes more time. Good news is, in the minus case, we actually implemented um, a, a set of algorithms um, with a partner of ours, H2O, which are really, really doing an excellent job on taking basically the computational hardware you have and max out the users. So using multiple cores um, and also like like measuring very well when it's no longer a great idea to continue the, the computation and basically stopping the computation at a point where it's no longer worth doing it. So we probably integrated one of the most efficient but certainly uh, one of the most powerful implementations of deep learning which is available to, in, in today's market. Um, but still, in comparison to a lot of data sets, you will, you will find it's not one of the fastest methods. Great. Thanks, Ingo. Uh, the next question is, how do you compare Rapid Miner to Google TensorFlow? We cover, well, <laughs> good question. So in terms of like, if you're really interested in building the exactly all internals of, an, of, an, uh, of the machine learning algorithm itself and only that, um, TensorFlow might be even the better option, period. Why? Because that's exactly the problem they solve. You can build the internal calculations in a very detailed way of, of, of the machine learning method itself. If you are actually interested in solving the complete end-to-end -end problem you actually have around data science, which starts with the data ingestion, all the data preparation work, so I'm not flying out of mind on the, the UI, but, but there's like hundreds of operators to help you, like combining data sets, filtering them, cleaning them, solving all kinds of data quality problems. So the whole data ingestion and data prep phase is so important because that's where you spend all the time. You can inject R scripts, Python scripts for doing more of that uh, in a more customized session if you need or want to. Then you have hundreds of different predefined machine learning methods uh, which are just one drag away, so that's much easier. You have all the validation and everything there. You have some visualization aspect and the integration into third-party applications uh, like data visualization products, Salesforce, uh, Marketer Hub, what you name it, um, to actually take those predictions and, and operationalize those predictions. So it's really this end-to-end -end from a rapid miner, while, for example, TensorFlow only focuses on this one particular element in the middle and optimizes this one step. I think. There are some places where this is a good idea because it really every single micro percentage might count. In reality, you, I think it's more important to solve actually the overall data quality, data ingestion, data preparation, and, and uh, validation problem because that's where you as an analyst spend so much more time on. So as a Ingo the scientist loves the idea of the TensorFlow, in Ingo the like business-oriented data scientists who actually want to solve a problem, things like, oh yeah, that's that's nice, but it's not actually solving my problem. I need to solve the rest as well, and that's where Rapid Miner really shines. Excellent, Ingo. We've got just time for one more question. Uh, any recommendations for sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation tasks? Assume you have variable-length input sequences that need to be classified and mapped to variable-length output sequences. Would deep learning or some other feature of Rapid Miner be able to do this? Ah, uh, tough one. Um, that's really tough one. I'm, I'm almost afraid. Um, <laughs> yes, the answer is you can do it in Rapid Miner, um, but it's really a tough one. The reason is, this is exactly this broad gray area between those more simple function learning situations where you take some input, which could be the sequence in this case, and map it to some output, which is typically just one value, 
and actually a more complex structure as an output. So we experimented some time ago with a, with a thing which was called uh, SVM struct, but it wasn't really used by a lot of people. So deep learning in general can be used for that. Deep learning in rapid minor, not so much at this current stage. Um, you could probably replicate this with multiple models, but to be honest, that's a very, very specific problem. And this was, would be, by the way, one of those situations where actually you might want to combine this with Yarn or, or TensorFlow and then integrate this into the overall rapid minor workflow. This is a very, very specialized problem, which is applicable certainly for certain use cases, but not for so many. Um, so there, that's a little bit complex. Um, you probably will need to combine multiple products here. But that's easily possible, so that's the good news. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ingo, for your time today. For those of you that we didn't get to your questions, we will be sending you out. Um, again, the, the, we'll be following up with a link to this recording. Feel free also to send your questions to Twitter. We are at RapidMiner. And with that, thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.